Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for coming for today's guest lectures. Uh, before we begin the lecture, we kindly welcome the honorables, um, the five dean of faculty of medicine of University of Uni Indonesia, um, Professor Prativi Sudarmono, PhD, consultant of microbiology, and also our Professor of Internal Medicine Specialist, um, Professor Dr. Nelwan, Consultant of Tropical Medicine and Infectious Diseases, as our moderator for today's guest lecture. And also great honors to our guest, Professor Jeremy Farrar, um, and the Professor from, of Tropical Medicine from Oxford University. And also the honorable of all professors Head of department and units, all of department staffs, all of, of residents, students, invited guests from hospital and medical faculty from Indonesia. We welcome faculty of medicine univers from University of Brawijaya, faculty of medicine um, Muhammadiyah University from Malang, faculty of medicine Pajajaran from Badung, Faculty of Medicine Tanjung Pura from Pontianak, Faculty of Medicine Udayana from Bali, and also Faculty Medicine of Hasanuddin from Makassar, and also Faculty of Medicine of University of Indonesia that um, that resides in Anatomy Hall. We welcome you all to the guest lecture titled Globalization and Infectious Diseases and Challenges and Opportunities. This event is held by Center for Research and Integrated Development of Tropical Health and Infectious Diseases of Medical Faculty of University of Indonesia in collaboration with Continuing Medical Education Faculty of Medicine, University of Indonesia. Now, we will hear the opening speech from Prof. I'm sorry. Uh, we will hear the opening speech from uh, Vice Dean of Faculty of Medicine of University of Indonesia, uh, Professor Prativi Sudarmono, PhD. Uh, yeah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, distinguished uh, participants and also Professor Jeremy Farrar uh, and colleagues, uh, it is uh, an honor to medical faculty, University of Indonesia, to, to conduct this uh, lecture especially because this lecture is going to be also transmitted to other medical faculties so and we can share uh, our knowledge and experience with uh, other colleagues in other medical faculties with uh, our distinguished guest professor jeremy farrar professor of tropical medicine oxford university so i i won't be very long so again uh, on behalf of medical faculty uh, we are thank we thank you very much for uh, your willingness to help us organize uh, this on behalf of the Center of Tropical Disease of Medical Faculty University of Indonesia. Thank you very much and uh, please enjoy the lecture. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, thank you, Professor Prativi, for the opening speech. Um, so, following the opening speech is the lecture from Professor Jeremy Farrar followed by a discussion that will be conducted by the moderator. So we are pleased to invite Professor Nalwan to conduct this session. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Uh, in the first place, uh, I want to welcome uh, Professor Jeremy Farrer, who, uh, who is the director of the Welcome Trust uh, major overseas program of Oxford University and Clinical Research Unit in Vietnam. Uh, the CV of 
Professor Jeremy Farrer is uh, very long. It will take the whole session, I think, if I read it all. <laughs> so maybe I can mention here that uh, beside uh, this uh, directorship, he also holds the Professor of Topical Medicine uh, chair, also chairman of the uh, Topical uh, Network 2010 and he is a global scholar of the Princeton University USA and a visiting professor of Imperial College in London. And uh, today uh, we will hear his presentation uh, on globalization and infectious diseases, challenges and opportunities. Professor Ferrer, the floor is yours. For the, uh introduction and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to coming. It's a pleasure to be uh, in Jakarta and uh, not just in Jakarta but across the whole of Indonesia by the sounds of it. Um, I'm very honoured to uh, be here. Thank you. I've never been so more nervous in all my life since I'm not quite sure who I'm talking to but I hope that in the rest of Indonesia you can see the slides uh, that we can see here. Um, so since uh, 1995, I have been uh, based in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, uh, permanently living there as part of the uh, Oxford University Clinical Research Unit in Vietnam. Uh, is it possible to get the lights down here a little bit? Otherwise, I fear the slides may may disappear. That's great. Thank you very much. So I've been living in Vietnam for 15 years now. Um, Indonesia is a very special place. I don't. Th I'm not sure any country can compare with the natural beauty of Indonesia. But in Vietnam, we try. Uh, this is the view from my office, um, and uh, I hope, as a result of the links between Vietnam and Indonesia, between Oxford and the University of Indonesia and with the links with others in Bali and uh, Makassar and other places around Indonesia that Bangdung that we can extend the links in the future. Um, the nature of the collaboration is that although I am officially a professor of tropical medicine in Oxford, uh, I spend less than one or two days a year in Oxford. Uh, my base is very much here in Asia and I think the, as I'll talk, the center of gravity for research needs to move to where the problems are at their greatest. And although I may carry a passport, uh, which comes from the Queen of England, I feel uh, alone, as though my home is here in Asia. And I hope that those collaborations can be extended to Indonesia uh, in the future. Not only is the first time I've ever spoken to a TV, it's also the first time I've ever used a Macintosh computer. So, so this is uh, just a little bit of background um, to myself. This is me a few years ago. I was born in Singapore uh, and did not go to the UK until I was a teenager, having been brought up in Singapore and Malaysia uh, in what is now called the Yemen. Uh, and lived as a teenager in Libya for many years uh, and even studied Arabic for many years at school although I'm afraid all of my Arabic has been lost subsequently. After uh, leaving my nappies uh, behind uh, I moved to the UK and I studied medicine at, uh, in London and then a, a PhD in Oxford in immunology and then in 1995 moved to Vietnam where I've spent most of my uh, professional life essentially. I'm going to talk about two subjects uh, and then come to globalization at the end. Two subjects which I hope are of interest to people uh, around Indonesia. One is dengue and one is tuberculosis, particularly TB meningitis. Uh, and particularly focus in dengue on, on why people get shock and what we can do to try and prevent it. Many infectious diseases globally are actually on the decline. Uh, although you don't often hear that, but uh, 
uh, in Vietnam, when I first moved to Vietnam in 1995, we saw about three or four hundred cases of severe malaria a year. Um, in 2010, we saw 30. Uh, the incidence of falciparum malaria in Indonesia is going down, although Vivax is not. But dengue is a disease for the 21st century. Uh, uh, there will be climate change and change in environmental use. But the biggest driver of the rising incidence of dengue is this environment here. And this environment is the massive urbanization that's going on across the world. Uh, the malaria mosquito likes living sensibly in the countryside, um, in forested areas and primary forests. The dengue mosquito loves living in dirty urban centers with large numbers of building construction sites going on where there are lots of people living in close proximity. The dengue mosquito in its whole life span only flies about less than 100 meters. Uh, and so in order to get dengue epidemics, you need to have people living in close proximity. Uh, and in the first part of the 20th century, we didn't live in close enough proximity to one another, and so dengue did not take off until after the Second World War, with the movement of people and the urbanization. So it's this that drives uh, dengue uh, increase globally, and the fact that in many parts of Indonesia and the rest of Asia, people still store water in, uh, in containers which are perfect breeding sites for the dengue mosquito. The good news is that there has been remarkable progress in the last five or ten years in dengue. Um, in 1998, I had a bet for a very um, expensive bottle of French wine as to whether there would be a dengue or a malaria mosquito first, uh, a va vaccine first. Um, I did not think a, a, a dengue vaccine was going to be possible in our working lives. Uh, but in fact, there has been tremendous progress made. And in many countries across the world, including Asia and Latin America, uh, the lead candidate made by Sanofi is going to be going into phase three trials in 2012. And that, I think, is real progress. Although whether it works or not is a very different matter. Um, and this slide is very important because if we start a dengue vaccine program in 2011, let's say, or 2012, this will be the progress that we make. We're likely to run the research trial for about three or four years. A few years later, the, de the dengue vaccine, if it works, might be approved for use. About five years later, it may be manufactured in decent quantities. And by 2025, if all goes well and the vaccine is made affordable, it might be used by some countries and we might vaccinate two-year-olds. The problem with dengue is that it's increasing in its age spectrum and therefore the two-year-olds will not be 16 or 15 until about 2040. And by 2040, absolutely everybody in this room and in all the other rooms across Indonesia will have retired. And we all have vaccines for tetanus and diphtheria, and we have vaccines, old vaccines for tuberculosis, and we have vaccines for pneumococcus and haemophilus, and we have vaccines for hepatitis B, and we have vaccines for Japanese encephalitis. But all of those diseases still fill all of our working lives. So even if a vaccine were to develop tomorrow, we must never forget that we're actually, for all our working lives, going to have to be treating patients in front of us. And therefore, clinical medicine and clinical practice, you must not put off learning about patients because a vaccine is coming tomorrow, because tomorrow may well be 35 years away. Not to say that I don't believe in vaccines, I very strongly do, but all vaccinologists are overly optimistic about the impact on public health, uh, and we must not delay thinking until we have a vaccine. This is the pathogenesis. This is quoted in every single textbook. Uh, anybody would read that you have a viremia in dengue 
followed by an inflammatory process, and it's the inflammatory process driven by the virus that leads to the disease. And the cascade of the immune response uh, comes down through a whole series of cytokines causing a capillary leak syndrome, which is dengue shock syndrome. The difficulty is, is that same cascade could be applied to almost every other disease. In fact, the cytokines that you measure are the same. If you measure cytokine profiles in dengue, you'll measure IL-6, you'll measure IL-10, you'll measure uh, TNF, and they'll be the same. But a patient with SARS or a patient with H5M1 or a patient with severe malaria actually doesn't look like a patient with dengue. They look different. And what nobody in any textbook has been managed to say is, why does this cascade, which looks so similar, actually lead to a clinical syndrome which is very specific for dengue? If, if I was to ask anybody in the room who's looked after dengue patients, is that dengue or is that SARS or is that H5M1, you would probably get it right 99 times out of 100. There is something very specific about dengue. And we mustn't hide behind the immunologists and, and just say it's this immune cascade. We have to work out what the cause is. And although dengue is called a hemorrhagic disease, in my opinion, the reality is hemorrhage is not very important in dengue. I think it's been misnamed. And although there is hemorrhage, there's no doubt there is hem some hemorrhage in dengue, the most important clinical feature is the capillary permeability which leads to a vascular permeability and dengue shock syndrome. Clinically, if you manage the dengue shock syndrome well, you can avoid almost all of the hemorrhagic complications, with one or two exceptions. People with uh, severe peptic ulcer disease, people with other bleeding tendencies. But on the whole, if you get the shock right, then you get dengue right. And if you get the shock wrong, you give people too much fluid, uh, too aggressively, then people who have prolonged shock or overtreatment can run into problems with hemorrhage, but it's relatively rare. There are other features of dengue which are becoming increasingly apparent, uh, encephalitis, psychiatric problems, uh, particularly in adults who get depressed, uh, particularly in the weeks following dengue infection, and also jaundice and cardiac abnormalities. But the most important thing is these chest x-rays here, and this is typical for anybody that's looked after dengue patients, uh, se severe shock, clinicians often in peripheral centers giving too much fluid, uh, too quickly, so that when the capillaries heal, the patients run into trouble with leak into their lungs. And in many centers, including uh, where I work in Ho Chi Minh City, it's not always possible to ventilate the patients. And once you develop ARDS and severe pulmonary edema, it's very difficult to manage the patients then in the absence of ventilation. And so this is, uh, this is sorry, it's not come out properly on the slide. This is work we did a long time ago to look at why people have capillary permeability and what drives that. And this is work actually done in healthy volunteers. I'm sorry, it hasn't come out very well, but on the top of the this axis, uh, you can see that th these are individual patients, f uh, female in black and white are males, and these are age along the bottom axis. And you can see that in the young individuals on the left-hand side of this graph, young children up until puberty leak through their capillary beds more often, m more easily than do adults. So young infants, particularly very young infants and young children who are growing rapidly, uh, they have a capillary bed which makes them leak more freely. And as you get older, that capillary permeability gets less, such that after puberty, you don't leak as much through your capillaries. And interestingly, after puberty, in fact, women through their uh, peripheral capillaries leak more than do men. And everybody knows this. If men and women get on long flights, it's women mostly that end up at the long flight with swollen ankles, less than do men. Women leak more through their capillary bed than do men. And we believe this is what underpins the fact that in children you see a lot of shock and low blood pressure in dengue, whereas in adults you see slightly less of that. 
It's because of the underlying physiology uh, of individuals. And on the right-hand side of this uh, slide, this is your capillary bed. This circle with the hairy structure inside it is the inside of all of your capillaries looked at through electron microscopy. And it's this that that immune cascade in dengue works through. So this is now blown up. Uh, on the left-hand side of the picture is a capillary, and on the right is in more detail. And that hairy structure, which looks a bit unpleasant, that is what is keeping your blood inside your blood vessels and stopping the plasma leaking out into the capillary beds. That's what's preserving you from going into pulmonary edema as you're sitting uh, half asleep and half awake uh, listening to a lecture. And dengue affects that hairy structure. And we believe that that is the holy grail of where changes that go on in dengue, uh, where the answer lies in preventing shock. As the glycocalyx lining this capillary bed, which is preventing fluids leaking out, is where the problem lies. And there it is in schematic format. So at the top of the slide is the endothelium. And you are very clever. You keep what you want to keep within the blood vessel, and you let a little bit leak out. And in dengue, too much fluid leaks out for reasons that are not clear, but are probably driven by the size of the proteins within the capillary bed, by the charge of them, and by their shape. And in some way that we still don't properly understand, uh, the dengue virus and the immune response to it destroys this uh, hairy layer within your capillaries and allows too much fluid to leak out, and that means you lose plasma and you, your blood pressure drops uh, whilst retaining the, blood, the red blood cells within the capillary bed. So clinically, you see that because your hematocrit goes up, your blood becomes more concentrated. And in fact, although you see shock on about day four to six of dengue or day seven, the reality is if you look a day after infection, you start to see capillary permeability. It is building up for days before you go into shock because you're compensating. And then for some reason, you decompensate and your blood pressure drops. And you can see that here on this slide. This is measuring the capillary permeability and the, sh the uh, leak through the capillary bed on the left-hand side. And you can see on the top line of that graph, apologies to people in the rest of the country who can't see the pointer, but if you see on the top of this graph, maybe you can now, uh, the capillary permeability and the leak starts on within 12 hours of infection. And you don't decompensate for about 72 to 96 hours after infection. So this is where the action of dengue is, uh, here in this hairy layer. Uh, and we believe this glycocalyx is lost as a result of interaction between antibodies, the virus, and possibly with NS1. And it allows too much fluid to leak. And so our work at the moment is trying to measure through skin biopsies. Here, on this slide here, we're measuring the degree of the glycocalyx uh, and how much protection you've got from leaking through your capillary bed. So in summary, in dengue, there is a slow, continuous leak which decompensates, particularly in children, uh, because they leak more than do adults. And actually, particularly in women after puberty, uh, they leak more than do males. Uh, there is a peak viremia, but it's actually difficult to link the viremia, the chemokine cascade, to dengue-specific clinical syndrome. Uh, there's hemoconcentration, and you get blood pressure changes. And all of this is affected by uh, your age, your gender, male or female, by your, ba your metabolic index, uh, you, how slim or fat you are, and comorbidities. And so how does that affect what we're trying to do in terms of improving dengue whilst we wait until 2040 and we all have a vaccine uh, to, to uh, prevent dengue? Well, we have moved, the other great progress has been in dengue in the last five years is the development of a diagnostic test which is possible to use early in illness. 
In the old days, we had to do it by PCR, which was expensive, or by waiting for an IgM or IgG response, uh, which took time to develop. We've now, not we, I have not been involved in this, but there has now been the development of a diagnostic test based on a protein specific to dengue called non-structural protein 1. And this has a good sensitivity within the first 72 hours of infection. When you talk about treatment, you really need a good diagnostic test. And it's, you can't develop treatment strategies until you have a good diagnostic test. It's a chicken and egg situation. Uh, I remember as a young doctor, uh, before the days of thrombolytic therapy for acute myocardial infarction, and it wasn't until we developed diagnostic tests for myocardial infarction that we started to develop thrombolytic therapy. Those two went hand in hand. And now in dengue, we have an early diagnostic test, and we can now start to think about treatment. The trouble is there's been very few clinical trials in dengue. Despite its growing incidence globally, uh, there's been very few clinical trials in dengue. So until 2010, the total number of patients entered into randomized control trials globally was less than 1,000. And of those 1,000, 925 were in one city uh, in one country in Asia. That compares in the same time frame to over almost quarter of a million patients randomized to the trials in malaria. That's a staggering statistic uh, and shows how slow we've been in the dengue community to try and influence outcome with treatment. Most previous trials have involved randomized control trials of fluid. Steroid, steroids have been trialed, but not very well. And there's never been a trial until recently of uh, an antiviral drug. And I think in the next few years, that is all going to change. And Indonesia could be, uh, perhaps should be, at the forefront of the development of therapeutic agents for dengue. Uh, it is a huge problem across the whole country, uh, and it's not going to get less uh, in the next 20 years. And if there was, uh, there are many diseases to study, but I think dengue and dengue therapeutics would be something uh, that Indonesia actually could lead the world on. And this has uh, been driven, uh, is going to go forwards with the uh, something called the International Consortium uh, for Antivirals for Dengue Therapeutics Network, which was launched earlier this year. The plan is that this will be open access, that all protocols, CRFs, informed consents, uh, processes for doing trials will be available and shared with everybody. And so any country, any hospital, any people interested would be able to take a protocol from the internet and adapt it for its own use and put it back on the internet in a wiki style. Uh, wiki has not got a good reputation at the moment because of wiki leaks, but it has some advantages. Um, and we hope that this will be taken up by everybody, uh, open access style. You could target the virus, which is what we've been doing. You could target the host response, or increasingly, I hope, in the future, targeting the vasculopathy and the capillary permeability. But just to give you some idea of some of the work we're doing, uh, this is uh, trying to work out the best targets for dengue therapeutics. Uh, this is uh, the polymerase, which is uh, specific to dengue, not found in human beings, and therefore is, an, is a relatively nice target. Uh, and the idea is to take dengue fever or severe dengue and shift the curve of the clearance of that virus from the, uh, from the orange curve through to the red curve. Uh, so you get faster clearance of the virus from the body, and the aim being that that improves clinical outcome. Uh, none of that has been proven. Uh, this is only first starting uh, out on this uh, pathway, but I think it is going to be worth uh, looking at. In fact, the first drug we looked at in dengue was chloroquine. Uh, chloroquine has been taken by more human beings than any other drug ever in the history of man, um, uh, with the possible exception of aspirin. Um, so it's a very, very safe drug. Um, and it's interesting to note, uh, although I think this is not related, so don't quote me on this, but chloroquine used to be used massively in Asia until the 1950s and 60s and then it was stopped use because of the resistance to malaria. 
um, and it very rare is very rarely used now. In fact, um, dengue took off in Asia as a result of urbanisation, but just happens to coincide with the same time that chloroquine stopped being used. Um, dengue appeared in Latin America at about the same time as chloroquine was stopped being used for malaria as well, and it's now increasing in Africa at the same time as chloroquine has stopped being used in Africa. So I suspect none of that is related, but it is interesting observation. And chloroquine has an antiviral effect. Um, it changes the pH in the vacuole where the virus is uh, housed before it is exported, uh, and it also has immunomodulatory functions. So uh, we tried looking at uh, chloroquine in dengue, um, and unfortunately short, showed no impact on what we were expecting, which was viral clearance. However, as a secondary analysis, and I stress this is as a secondary analysis, not the primary analysis, so this should be interpreted with great caution. But if you look on the chloroquine column, and you look on the placebo column, this is in uh, about 300 patients treated, uh, there is an apparent reduction in the chloroquine-treated group for progression to severe disease. Uh, the number It was not powered to show this, and therefore uh, I don't think people should start treating dengue with chloroquine tomorrow, but it is interesting that there is a reduction with a odds ratio of 0 0.6, uh, which wasn't powered, and therefore it goes through one, so it is not ultimately significant but it's very close to significant uh, and is, I think, of interest and something we may take on in the future. So these are the trials that we have planned in dengue. Uh, we are have just about to finish a trial properly looking systematically at steroids. Uh, we are in the middle of a trial of an antiviral drug. Dengue is lucky because it's very similar to hepatitis C, and the hepatitis C industry for therapeutics is huge. Uh, there is a very active hepatitis C program in most big in pharmacy uh, globally. And the enzymes in hepatitis C and in dengue are very similar. So out of the hepatitis C program has come some drugs which are very potentially very interesting in dengue. So we are halfway through a, a, an antiviral uh, 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 test of a hepatitis C drug in dengue at the moment. Platelet transfusions are not often used in Vietnam. They're not often used, in my understanding, here in Indonesia. But in some countries in the region, Singapore, Philippines, almost everybody with dengue gets platelets. I think that's personally dangerous. I don't think many patients with dengue need platelets. Uh, and when you give platelets, you give a huge protein load, uh, which I think is dangerous in dengue. But somebody at some point needs to try uh, platelets, uh, a randomized control trial of platelets in dengue. And then in the future, antiviral drugs, immune suppressive drugs, and even potentially monoclonal antibodies. But dengue is changing. Um, I believe in Indonesia, but certainly across the rest of Asia, dengue age spectrum is changing. Uh, it's certainly a very severe disease in infants, um, but it is going now throughout the ages of man and women, um, such that uh, when I first moved to Vietnam in 1995, the median age for a dengue patient was six. The median age in 2010 for a dengue patient in our hospital is 10, and that's quite a significant shift in 10 years. We used to have 90% people under the age of 15 and 10% above 15. We now have 50-50. 50% are children and 50% are adults. And therefore the disease is changing and with that change is coming a change in the spectrum of comorbidities. So um, uh, people in Asia used to look like this statue of David um, uh, that's in Florence, but increasingly obesity is coming to Asia, and that is influencing the way uh, dengue presents itself because uh, people who are uh, overweight also leak through their capillaries more, and so it's more difficult to manage patients who are a little bit overweight. Pregnant women, as the age group of dengue changes, dengue has a bigger influence in pregnancy, uh, and it has an influence both on the mum and on the baby. Gastric perforation uh, leads to increased problems with bleeding. Uh, 
uh, in dengue. And as pyloric, uh, as uh, infections leading to peptic ulcer increase, we will see more bleeding from the gastrointestinal tract. Nobody in the world has any idea of how HIV and dengue will interact. The number of reports of co-infected people between HIV and dengue are absolutely almost non-existent globally. Uh, and if there was one research area which I think deserves great attention, it's whether people who have HIV are worse when they get a dengue infection or whether indeed they're protected uh, from severe dengue. Um, and that would be a very, very important study to be done. Hemoglobinopathies, patients with underlying cardiovascular and uh, more at risk of hemorrhage, uh, and people with chronic lung disease. These are all impacting on our ability to manage patients with dengue as the spectrum of disease uh, changes. So that's the end of the first part of the talk uh, on dengue, and I I'll, can certainly take any questions uh, at the end, um, but I'm going to shift a little bit now to another area which is personally, uh, I think, very interesting and I hope of interest to uh, people around Indonesia, and that is TB meningitis. So I'm a clinician. I do a clinical ward round every day. Uh, and in fact, I trained as a neurologist originally um, before going into infectious diseases. And sorry, this slide hasn't come out, but when we first started studying neurological infections in our hospital, it was assumed that it was all encephalitis and pyogenic acute bacterial meningitis. And it wasn't until finally the penny dropped that actually in two hospitals in Ho Chi Minh City, we see 500 cases of TB meningitis per year, an enormous burden of disease. And I suspect in Jakarta and around the rest of Indonesia, there's a huge amount of tuberculous meningitis which is going undiagnosed. Uh, and uh, the outcome, if you miss the diagnosis, is universally fatal. Uh, and so anything which can improve our ability uh, to study TB meningitis, I think, would be very uh, popular, uh, very useful. Because this is actually the difficulty. This is a daily occurrence on the ward where I work, which is patients coming in with a partially cloudy CSF. Uh, they may have a rash either uh, bleeding into uh, their conjunctiva or a rash in their skin. This is a patient with scrub typhus. Um, this is a patient with meningococcal disease. Uh, this is actually a patient with an infection uh, called streptococcus suis. Um, and it's very, very difficult to tell those apart, particularly in hospitals like the University Hospital here in Jakarta, where you're receiving patients who have been referred to you from somewhere else and have had treatment in another hospital. Distinguishing between uh, bacterial meningitis and TB meningitis when somebody's had four or five days of uh, antibiotics is extremely difficult. And if you get it wrong, the patients die. Seen this slide a lot, but this uh, just shows how important this region is to infectious diseases and why TB and things like TB meningitis are so common. A huge number of people live within this part of the world. 50% of the world's population lives within this red circle. 50% uh, of the world's population. It's an enormous concentration of people, and that has a huge impact on disease, so that although TB incidence rates are much higher in sub-Saharan Africa, so if you're red on this map, sorry, it's coming out black, but sub-Saharan Africa, South Africa, and the whole of sub-Saharan Africa has the highest incidence of TB anywhere in the world. But as a result of the number of people living in Asia, if you're purple in this map or red, it means you've got a lot of TB. So in terms of incidence, Africa dominates TB. In terms of total numbers, Asia dominates. And as HIV becomes more common, as it inevitably will in Asia, TB incidence is going to increase. Uh, and I suspect will become more important in the future. And yet we've made almost no progress in TB uh, over the last uh, 100 years or so. If you look at what we do to diagnose TB in 2010, you have to go back to 1882 before it changed. I'm not sure there's anything in the rest of our lives that we do where we use the same thing in 2010 as we did in 1882. Your mobile phone, your car, your camera, 
your MP3 player, uh, whatever you do, the clothes you wear, everything has changed. And yet in TB, we are living in an age of about 120 years ago. The microscope you see on the uh, left or right, depends on which you're looking at, I suppose, from 1882, you could use today to diagnose tuberculosis. And it's not just the diagnosis that hasn't moved very far, it's also treatment. So Robert Koch invented the smear, the stain, which was taken up by Zeal Nilsson, that is still used in every hospital everywhere in the world. That was invented over 100 years ago. The vaccine uh, was invented in the 19th century. And the drugs that we use, the most uh, they were all invented um, before I was born. And that was not yesterday. And there's been no change in that. So the drug, the four drug regime you use in Indonesia was actually developed uh, in the 1950s and 60s, in fact, earlier than that. And there's been very little progress since then. So this is a case study for the clinicians amongst you. This is a case from last uh, two weeks ago in Ho Chi Minh City. A 32-year-old male comes in with a seven-day history of fever, headache, and vomiting. Uh, they've been admitted to another hospital, they've been treated with antibiotics, but unfortunately you're the treating physician and it's two o'clock in the morning and you don't know what antibiotics they've had. Uh, but the patient was transferred to you because they weren't getting very much better. The Glasgow Coma Score was 14, yesterday it was 15, so they're getting a little bit worse. And they have a mild fever and neck stiffness, no rash, no focal neurology and the chest x-ray and the CT scan are essentially both normal. They have a white count of about 11,000 in the blood. They're HIV negative. That was a good thing to do. The CSF is a little cloudy, but it's not very cloudy. And the CSF glucose is 36%. It's low, but it's not very low. There's 450 white cells, 50% of them are neutrophils, and the protein is mildly elevated, and the cryptococcus is negative. What is this? And at 2 o'clock in the morning, as a junior doctor, what do you do? Do you give antibiotics? Do you wait and do nothing? Do you give antibiotics for acute bacterial meningitis and hope that's what it is? Do you give antibiotics and steroids for acute bacterial meningitis and hope that's what it is? Do you give TB drugs? Do you give TB drugs and steroids? Do you give antibiotics, steroids, TB drugs and everything else and hope you'll just, by giving everything, you'll do what's right? This is something that I don't know in Jakarta and the rest of Indonesia, but certainly in Ho Chi Minh City, we face this decision every week uh, in, making, in trying to make a diagnosis. How to decide what to do and how to evaluate what you do and whether the patient's getting better. Extraordinarily difficult, which even after 15 years of working in Ho Chi Minh City, I still find uh, every week a real challenge. So what options do we have? Well, we have clinical options. We can try and image the patients, both in the chest, to try and get evidence of TB. But the problem is, across Indonesia and across Vietnam, many people have got evidence of TB on a chest X-ray. Uh, in fact, 20 to 30 percent of people have got some evidence of current or old TB when you X-ray healthy individuals. So T imaging of the chest is not so helpful. CSF stain, CSF culture, molecular, I'll talk about in a minute, and in future maybe metabolites. If you have uh, a tuberculoma, as on the CT scan at the bottom, it's relatively easy. But those are relatively rare to see, especially on admission. So it remains incredibly difficult. So with data from about 2,000 patients that we uh, have admitted over the years in Vietnam, we've come up with a very simple clinical algorithm to try and distinguish between tuberculous meningitis and acute bacterial meningitis. And we use this now on a daily basis. This was published in The Lancet uh, a couple of years ago. And with this, we have uh, improved the sensitivity and specificity of diagnosing TB meningitis uh, incredibly. And this is now available on a computer screen or on a poster. And if we follow this, we think we get it right far more often than if we stand at the edge of the be bed and pretend we know what we're talking about and make a guess, because that's ultimately what we all do, although we hate to admit it. So this, what it does is it takes five simple criteria. It takes the age of the patient, and if you're over 36, you score two. If you're under 36, you score zero. The white blood cell count, how long you've had the history, 
six days is the cutoff, uh, the total CSF white count, and the percentage of neutrophils. And if you go through this algorithm with every patient you see, and you add up the score, and if you have a score that's less than four, you're much more likely to have tuberculous meningitis, and if it's greater than four, you're much more likely to have back acute bacterial meningitis. And this is what we use now on a regular basis and is available to everybody uh, 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 through a website or you can just print this off very, very simply. So there are five simple criteria. The age, the white blood cell count, the length of the history, how many cells in the CSF, and the percentage of neutrophils. And with that, we've uh, improved our sensitivity to about 85%, uh, and, and it's very specific for acute bacterial meningitis versus TB. And with that, we make decisions. Imaging can be helpful. These are typical MR and CT scan images. Uh, but the, the difficulty is that on admission, when you really need to make a diagnosis, because if you fail to make a diagnosis in, on the admission, the patients will gradually deteriorate and they'll either die or they'll be left with severe sequelae. TB meningitis is an acute event and needs to be treated aggressively. And imaging on admission is often normal. Subsequently, if you get the diagnosis wrong, the patient develops these horrible images with tuberculomas and infarcts and strokes. And by the time they've developed this, uh, it's very difficult as a clinician to do anything about it. The ZN stain of the CSF, developed 120 years ago, is still a remarkably good test. And the problem with the ZN stain is not with the microbiology department, he says, with the head of microbiology in the room. It's with the clinicians. And the problem is infectious diseases has been left with infectious disease clinicians for too long. Uh, one of the advantages of coming from neurology was having more confidence in taking a CSF. When you take a CSF, everybody is nervous. Neurology is the one specialty everybody is terrified about. And you take a CSF very cautiously, and that's, that is correct, you should. It's an invasive procedure which you should be careful in taking. But the danger of taking a, a lumbar puncture in a CSF is putting the lumbar puncture needle into the patient. Once you've put the needle in, you've taken the risk. It then doesn't matter how much you, volume you take. I'm talking about adults here. Because each of us makes about somewhere between 150 and 250 mils of CSF every day. And patients with acute infections make more than that. So having taken the risk of putting a needle into somebody's back to take a CSF, in my view, it's now unethical to not take a decent volume. You've put the patient at risk, and the only way of helping the microbiology department is to take a decent volume. And that doesn't mean a microliter. It means 10 microliters from an adult. There are very few bacteria in the CSF. There are a certain number of bacteria per mil. There might be one, there might be two, there might be three. If you take one mil of CSF, you won't see TB. If you take 10, you probably will if it's there. And therefore, having put the patient at risk, do the ethical thing which is to take a decent volume. And then when you've taken that decent volume, more CSF is thrown away around the world, and I apologize if there are people from the biochemistry and hematology departments here, most CSF is thrown down the sink around the world because the biochemistry and hematology departments do their glucose and their protein and their cell counts from a tiny little amount of CSF and the rest of it they throw away. Organizing the laboratories and the clinicians to make sure that the CSF is used efficiently and most of it goes to the microbiology department is absolutely critical to establishing a diagnosis. And the other thing is to not take your CSF, go for lunch, walk around the hospital, go and meet a friend for afternoon tea and end up in the microbiology department at 4 p.m. The time from the patient 
to the microbiology department is absolutely critical. If it takes you two hours to get there, you're wasting the walk. You might as well throw it away because bacteria of all descriptions are very sticky and they stick to glass and they stick to plastic and they're heavier than water and CSF and so therefore they sink to the bottom. So you need to go straight from the patient to the laboratory and you need to make sure microbiology, hematology, biochemistry are, are really taking what they need rather than what they'll throw away. And if you do that, you can get a diagnosis for tuberculous meningitis in 60 to 70 percent or maybe 80 percent of all cases from what I guess is your average in most hospitals globally of about 10 percent. Large volume and taken quickly to the appropriate laboratories. So CSF is very good, very good, but it is essential that you take a large volume. It's essential that you get quickly to the lab and it's essential that it's looked at by an experienced person and unfortunately you have to look for 20 minutes to be able to say this is not TB. And it's essential to not let the biochemistry and haematology department take three mils and use 100 microliters and throw out the other 2.9 mils. Apologies to all biochemists and haematologists in the audience. Serological tests, which many uh, people try and sell around the world for tuberculosis, are all completely useless and are a waste of money. In fact, worse than that, they're dangerous because they're neither sensitive nor specific. So on this graph is the target zone of where you would like a test to be. This is the zone where you would like it to be both sensitive and specific, and this is what you're targeting with any test. All the commercial available serological tests for TB fall way, way short of that in this area here. And purchasing and using these tests is, I think, a complete waste of time. So the diagnosis of TB, ideally we would like something sensitive and specific, we'd like something rapid, and we'd like something that could both diagnose TB and show you whether there was drug resistance or not. And we'd like it to be practical, and we'd like it to be affordable. And every so often, something, hap something comes along which does all of those things. And that happened uh, a few years ago with this report, which has been very important. Sadly, it came out of academic work rather than from industry. Uh, and therefore, there's been very little money to develop this as a diagnostic test. But the microscopic observational drug susceptibility assay for TB is sensitive, it's specific, it's rapid, you get a drug sensitivity at the same time as the diagnosis, it's practical, you can do it in any lab anywhere in the world, and it costs about a dollar. Unfortunately, as I say, it was developed as an academic ent enterprise in Peru, and it has not been backed by commercial enterprise, and therefore few people have taken it up. Uh, We've taken it up and we're using it both for sputum and for CSF, and it's been remarkably effective. All you need is an incubator, a 96-well plate or a 48-well plate. You need some very simple media, and you, you need to look at the 96-well plate through an inverted microscope. And if you do that, you can get a diag This is what you see after uh, a few days compared to six weeks for normal culture. You see the growth of the TB in this culture system. And if there was one test that I would try to develop in every laboratory who looks after TB, it would be the MODS technique. Uh, and I hope sometime in 2011, we will help run a workshop for anybody interested in Indonesia um, on, on the utilization of this technique in acute diagnostics. Uh, I think it's been a remarkable contribution uh, and you don't have to buy it. And it's incredibly uh, sensitive and specific against any of the gold standards uh, that you might want to use. And at the time, it caused a great splash in the BBC and other places. Um, and I think this headline was realistic. It's a faster TB test, and it can save lives. These are graphs showing the speed at which you get it. Uh, so the red line here uh, on the edge is what you get with traditional culture. 
it takes uh, can take up to 30 days or 40 days to become positive. By that time, everybody with TB meningitis will be dead, so it's not very useful. Uh, the blue line is with an automated system. It's a little bit quicker. The MODS is positive after about five days. And so that's not ideal, but it's much better than anything else that's gone before. Of course, this area on the curve, this area to the left of that line, is where we would dearly like to be. Uh, and the MODS can't get you there. Uh, but there has been now the development of a new technique called the Gene Expert, uh, which I think will also have a huge impact. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's too expensive, but uh, WHO and FIND are hoping to get this price down. It's basically an amplification. Um, you take the sputum uh, or the CSF, you put it into this, uh, this uh, device here, and it goes into a cassette, and the cassette gets into a machine, and that's the end of any technical hands-on result, uh, hands-on um, uh, time. So it's very quick and it's very attractive use, and it's a closed system. And that gives you a result in about an hour and a half. Uh, it's based on dry PCR primers and an amplification technique. And it's very specific and sensitive. Uh, against culture methods, it gets up to 90, 95% for sputum. So this could has the potential, if the WHO managed to get the price down, uh, to be incredibly powerful technique. It gives you both diagnosis and uh, drug resistance. The problem is, uh, although it's uh, available in two hours, the machine itself currently costs $60,000. Uh, and the cassettes currently cost $40 for each cassette. So that is not usable by any of us. Uh, find the group that are negotiating these prices for the WHO anticipate in 2011 that the machine might come free and the cassettes may come down to $10. Now if that comes down to $10, I don't know what a blood culture costs in Jakarta, but I guess it's not, it's about the same. Uh, it's about the same in Vietnam. So at that price it might be usable. And I think if it gets more used, that price of $10 will come down to $5, and then $2, and then it really is usable by people. Uh, so I think TB diagnostics actually, finally, in 2011 or 2012, will see real progress. So back to the patient that I presented at the start, this case study. So um, certainly if there's anybody in the room that wants to guess what was wrong with the patient, they're very welcome to decide uh, whether you would give uh, weight or give antibiotics or give antibiotics and steroids or antibiotics, steroids and TB drugs or go home and think about it and come back tomorrow. Um, we used a uh, uh, microscope um, and we used the algorithm and we used mods uh, and in fact the patient turned out to have TB. Uh, the algorithm said tuberculosis meningitis, and so therefore, on the basis of that, we treated for TB meningitis, and three days later, the mods came back positive. Uh, and so we uh, were lucky, and we got that one right, and we give everybody three, uh, four drugs for TB meningitis plus uh, steroids. Um, and the patient got better and subsequently went home. The next big trial of TB meningitis we're about to start on uh, in February will be a much higher dose of rifampicin uh, in addition to the other TB drugs plus the addition of a fluoroquinolone to try and improve outcome. Finally, come back to the title of the talk uh, originally, which was of globalization, infectious diseases, challenges, but also opportunities. And the world is getting to be a much smaller place. Uh, so that what I, I came from London yesterday, what I had in London yesterday, here, I then got on one of these red lines, which is a plane, and I flew to Singapore, so I picked up a few infections in Singapore, and then I flew to Jakarta, and I brought London and Singapore infections with me, and if you're in the front row, <coughs> you're likely to get infected with something from London uh, that I had yesterday. Uh, and tomorrow I'll be in Ho Chi Minh, or the next day I'll be in Ho Chi Minh City, so I'll take Jakarta infections with me to Ho Chi Minh City. The world is becoming a much smaller place. When I was, uh, when I left Asia as a child, I got on a, a boat to go to uh, England when I was uh, 
a child and I got off the boat six weeks later. If I'd had an infection when I got on, I'd have either died on the boat or I'd have recovered by the time I get to London. In other words, in the old days, pre-aircraft uh, travel, we were all much more isolated than we now are. And we saw that through SARS. We saw that through H1N1. Uh, it came from Mexico to Indonesia within probably less than a, m less than a month and actually probably within a few weeks. Um, and the other dramatic change that will occur during our working lives, everybody in the audience, will be a huge increase in travel between sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. The investment in sub-Saharan Africa from China, from Indonesia, uh, even from Vietnam now, is huge. And the travel between China, Asia, Indonesia, Middle East, and Africa is increasing exponentially every year. Uh, and that will have major implications for what you deal with as infectious diseases physicians here in Indonesia, uh, I suspect. I suspect there will come a time when one of the viral hemorrhagic fevers gets off a plane, a patient with it gets off a plane in Jakarta, uh, and you won't know whether that's dengue or whether that's Ebola or an equivalent. And that's a very frightening prospect, uh, which I think we must all be aware of. So as the world gets smaller, and we get more connected, uh, inevitably it raises questions about how to equitably share samples and share data. And this has been a particular issue for Indonesia, I know, and for the rest of the world. And this is a view uh, from the Washington Post and gets at, I think, an absolutely critical element. And i sorry it hasn't come out. I won't read all of it. But uh, this is from the Washington Post of a couple of years ago. Um, Here's a concept you've probably never heard of, viral sovereignty. The extremely dangerous idea asserts that deadly viruses are the sovereign property of individual nations, even though they cross borders and could pose a pandemic threat to the rest of the world. If the concept of viral sovereignty had been applied to HIV, we would not have the drugs that we have currently available uh, for use. Even more dangerous to extend the sovereignty to viruses that, like flu, can be carried across borders or by migrating birds. The failure to share potentially pandemic viral strains with World Health Agencies is morally reprehensible. That's the view uh, expressed uh, and published in the Washington Post and, and is a view that is, uh, that is out there by people. I think sharing uh, data and sharing samples is actually the right thing to do. However, what this article fails to address is that unless the world shares the benefits of that sharing of samples, then it isn't right to share. So in other words, if you have H5M1 in Vietnam and you're willing to share that with global health agencies, I think global health agencies have got a moral obligation to share the benefits of that sharing. In other words, that if you share viruses, that you'll share access to vaccines, to drugs, to diagnostics at a price that countries can afford. Uh, and unless uh, this person who wrote this uh, uh, balances that argument with the only fair way forward is that sharing goes in both directions, both in sharing samples and sharing the benefits of sharing samples. And that means access to drugs and therapeutics. And unless we get both sides of that equation right, I don't think we, c we will be in an equitable world. Uh, and at the moment, we're not in an equitable world. So I think uh, sharing is the right thing to do, but sharing has responsibilities on both sides, not just the people willing to share the samples, but also on those willing to share the vaccines and the drugs that come from it. So there is a, the challenge is to develop a model for international scientific cooperation because Indonesia, Vietnam, United Kingdom, the United States, China, we are all in a very small world now and we do have to try and work together, but I don't think at the moment we have a mechanism for that. And ultimately, I think it really comes down to to one word said many times, and that's trust. If you don't have trust between collaborators built up over many, many years and realize that sharing samples and data and publications and science also brings with it a responsibility to share benefits of those uh, work, then that trust is not built up. But unless you try, you never get started. Trust just doesn't happen. It happens because people get to know each other, they work together, they realize that other people 
are willing to share everything and therefore that trust builds up over many years and I think uh, you can't build that up in minutes or days or hours or months it takes years uh, and you can lose it in an instant but I think it's worth trying because the world is getting smaller and I think it is worth trying to build up that trust and judge people by what they do and if they work well together and there is balance and all parties share in the benefits then I think it is worth trying I think the center of gravity which has traditionally been in Oxford in Harvard in New York in Washington in Geneva in Paris has got to shift I hope that involves people who don't necessarily carry a Vietnamese passport or an Indonesian passport I hope there is still room for people who are in who are working in Asia but I think the center of gravity for, for scientific research has to move to where the center of gravity of the world's population is that red circle I showed earlier the center of gravity for research endeavor has to be based in places like the University of Indonesia or in Bali or in Bangdong or in Ho Chi Minh City or wherever it is and scientists from America UK France should move to these countries if they're invited and that's where they should base uh, their collaborative research so I think the center of gravity has to shift and there has to be equitable sharing of the research uh, and that means sharing in everything in terms of the benefits of that research and finally a slide many of you have seen clinical research which is what I spend my life doing and I think is absolutely critically important we have to get it we have to make it easier this is a slide uh, which shows the current process of going from an idea this is somebody here who I've worked with for many years he has a bright idea about how to reduce the 40% mortality in this patient group and in the old days he would be able to get on with that in real time the problem is that we've made the process of clinical research so bureaucratic and so over regulated that this individual has to go through this pile of work through this institutional review board back and forth back and forth over months and months and months they have to have innumerable teleconferences and because we live in Asia and we're often having them to Europe in the United States we always have to be up in the middle of the night on a teleconference uh, because we can't expect people in London or Washington to uh, be up at night so we have to be up at night you go back to the IRB this poor person is now deluged under this mountain of paperwork and finally one or two years later with protocols that go to three or four hundred pages they get back to the patient that they want to help and I think we've all made that process far too complicated and difficult in a way that I think is actually unethical uh, because 40 percent of these patients are still dying of a disease that we could probably do something about and with that uh, I will come to an end and thank you very much for your time and thank you to everybody else around the rest of the country who's uh, I hope kept awake through that um, and thank you very much thank you very much uh, Professor Perr for this uh, very uh, interesting and I think a very uh, useful uh, presentation for which maybe uh, many of us uh, in the room or in other parts of Indonesia will uh, have some questions for you and uh, maybe all guests from uh, outside Jakarta can uh, present any questions if uh, there are any uh, from Universitas uh, Unpad, who always uh, do research with the Dutch in Holland, or from Andalas in uh, Padang. Not yet. Maybe I shift to the persons in the room. <laughs> Ada 
Uh, tolong tolong uh, sebutkan nama dan uh, institutnya. Ya, terima kasih. Ini kita hidup sekarang ini. Iya. Offnya di tekan mulai. Di belakangnya. Hmm, ya, nggak k- kasih mereka aja dulu karena waktunya mungkin mereka bisa tutup gitu. Ya silahkan kalau ada yang ingin bertanya. Ya boleh bahasa Indonesia, nggak apa-apa nanti kita terjemahkan. Selanjutnya mungkin eh, kalau dari Unan belum ada pertanyaan, saya eh, silahkan dari Unpad kembali. Dari Unpad silahkan. Belum ada, saya teruskan saja eh, dengan eh, Udayana, eh, silahkan dari Universitas Udayana, yeah. Prof Nelwa. Yeah. I'm Dr. Madit Sil from Udayana University. Uh, I have one question for Professor Jeremy Farah. Uh, very interesting to learn about the antiviral uh, for management uh, dengue uh, viral infection. Very good prospect for the future. But uh, based on the Uh, pathogenesis of the dengue infection still uh, we still learn about the scleroheterologous infection where the, the first we must treat the antibody viral complex as the main of the pathogenesis or oh, where, where the role of the anti antiviral based on this pathogenesis thank you uh, it's it's a very very good question um the uh, i'm sure you're right that the uh severe dengue is driven by uh initially a viral infection you can't get dengue without a viral without infection with the virus and that virus then drives uh an immune cascade um which is very poorly understood But I think as a general rule in infectious diseases, uh, the quicker you can get rid of the pathogen, the better. Uh, that is true for um, all, mo- almost all infectious diseases. So, so although that uh, meningococcal disease may be due to an exuberant immune response, uh, indeed severe malaria is also due to uh, in part an immune response, as many infectious diseases are. But that still means that 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 by affecting the pathogen and allow uh, clearing the pathogen quicker is a general tenant of infectious diseases, uh, and therefore I think it's reasonable to say that uh, an antiviral drug has the potential uh, by reducing the dengue viral load quicker to reduce the symptomatology in the first 72 hours. That doesn't mean to say that an antiviral drug. And something that affects the immune system wouldn't work together very well, um, but I think re- removing the pathogen is important in almost every infectious disease. And indeed, the the experience to date of immune modulators in infect- acute infectious diseases has been hugely disappointing. Uh, with options. Ya, uh, ini uh, sudah ada jawabannya. Uh, kita lanjutkan uh, for the next uh, university uh, from uh, 
Tanjung Pura, maybe in Pontianak. Uh, Thank you, Prof. Nelwan. Uh, we have uh, one question from the student here. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Felix. Oh, I want to ask a question. Uh, if a pregnant woman suffers a TB infection, is there any possibility for the neonatus to suffer a TB infection also, and it, that was transmitted during uh, her mother's pregnancy? And if there's a case like this, what is our management? Thank you. Yeah, it's also a great question, and um, uh, the truth is that the, the literature on dengue during pregnancy uh, is very limited. Uh, and another topic of research which Indonesia could take on would be uh, dengue infections in pregnant women. It's a really big question. Um, pre pregnant women are difficult to manage with fluids uh, and you're always worried both about the mother and the child. Uh, and there have been cases of um, spontaneous uh, loss of the child uh, and or even of uh, maternal to child infection with dengue where a, a, a baby has been born with dengue infection infected by the mother. Um, the management I don't think is different to managing anybody else. It's very careful fluid ma management of the mother and as always when dealing with anything in a pregnant woman, um, your primary concern always has to be I think with the, with the woman. Uh, and you have to do everything to try and improve the health of the woman because by doing so you'll probably be the best for the child as well. Um, but pregnant women are more prone to bleeding, they're more prone to fluid overload uh, and they're very, very difficult to manage. There is no secret, I'm afraid, of uh, there, is, there is nothing uh, specific to say other than very, very careful fluid management. Yeah, uh, Professor Ferrer, maybe you can also give some insight into a pregnant woman uh, with TB and uh, any effect on the uh, neonate, uh, if you have uh, any data on this. The, one of the great problems in clinical research is that as soon as you have a pregnant woman, she almost always gets excluded from any clinical research. <laughs> So if you take H1N1, the single biggest uh, at-risk group globally have been pregnant women. And yet if you go to the literature and you look how many studies of influenza in pregnant women there have been, it's very close to zero. And, and that is an absolute tragedy because now the highest risk group in influenza globally is pregnant women and yet we essentially have almost no data. And actually the same is true in TB. Maybe you've done things here in Indonesia, but, but the reality is nobody studies TB in pregnancy, and yet we know pregnancy is a risk factor for TB and disseminated TB. And so what we say is the same as we said for dengue, which is you try and do everything you can for the mum, you use the drugs that you would use normally, and you try and get her better because that's the best thing for the baby. But, but which drugs to use, in what doses, uh, I think the literature is absolutely, uh, um, is very little. All I can say is what we do in practice, which is that we uh, essentially continue the same TB drugs, uh, rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and or ethambutol, um, and we try and treat the TB in the mum. But, uh, uh, that's another area that really is neglected. Thank you, Professor Ferrer. We will uh, now go to the next uh, university, maybe uh, from Nas uh, in, in Makassar. Yes, we have a question. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first first question is, uh, what is the most important challenge regarding the globalization and infectious disease, especially uh, dengue and meningitis tuberculosis for us in Asia? 
the and next, uh, next question. And the next question is, uh, you explained about uh, severe thrombocytopenia. What do you mean about that? Uh, we need explanation. Explanation. Thank you. Repeat. Uh, maybe uh, the, the question was about uh, the present challenge to globalization now. Uh, is it uh, the dengue and TB or any other question or any other challenges? And the second one is uh, about the severe uh, pancit uh, uh, cytopenia that's uh, occurring in dengue. Okay, so I'll take the first one because uh, because whatever I say can't be right or wrong. Um, what's the most important challenge for Asia in terms of infectious diseases? I I think the greatest challenge uh, for Asia, um, if I, if I think about from Vietnam uh, perspective, but I think Indonesia is very similar, is the fact that you're we're both countries are going through the challenge of seeing the rise of uh, the metabolic diseases, diabetes, uh, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, stroke, and we have not yet got rid of the infectious diseases. If you look back to the 20th century, to Europe, most of the infectious diseases had finished, uh, not finished, but they had lessened in their impact before the chronic diseases rose. The healthcare systems of Indonesia and Vietnam are having to deal with both at the same time. And that is a real challenge because looking after patients who require chronic care, whether it be diabetes or HIV or uh, hypertension or diabetes, requires a completely different health system to young people with infectious diseases. A young person with an infectious disease is previously healthy, they come into hospital, they either die or they get better. And that happens quite quickly. So your hospital structures are set to deal, to deal with that. We're now having to deal with people who require long-term care, often in the community, where hospitals are not the best place to deliver diabetic care or care of hypertension. So I think the biggest challenge for Asia as it so rapidly develops is the ability to design a health system which can deliver chronic care to people as well as still looking after patients with dengue, typhoid, uh, malaria, TB, and TB and HIV. So it's that dual illness spectrum which I think is the biggest challenge. I think in terms of specific infectious diseases, I think it I don't I I think getting into debates about league tables, premier division of the big three versus other disease. I think that's a, a that's a slightly silly argument. Uh, I think we should work on the things in front of us every day and have the flexibility to respond when that changes. Um, but if you had to push me on the most important, I would say it's drug resistance in the 21st century. The second question of pancytopenia in dengue is another excellent question to which I've got no answer, uh, but I'll try. Um, you're absolutely right, in dengue, as with many viral infections, there is clearly some degree of bone marrow suppression during the acute illness and you get a low lymphocyte count and a almost pancytopenia with a low platelet count. The cause of that and why it happens is completely unknown, um, but is a feature of all, most severe viral infections, including dengue. And of course, if the platelet count drops too much, that can be a problem, uh, but usually, usually it does not. The answers, uh, I think, uh, is uh, quite clear now. Uh, yeah, we'll problems back. we face. Uh, maybe the next uh, round will be given to Muhammadiyah uh, University in Malang. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Professor Nelwan. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, me, Tony uh, Chinrati, is from uh, University of Malang. We have known each other and collaboration in Petri, Indonesia. 
Uh, my uh, question is uh, about uh, vaccination. I'm very interested about the vaccination. Uh, nowadays, uh, we create a vaccination, but the generic uh, tetravalent vaccination. But it is still a problem about uh, the type of uh, the dengue. Usually, if we use uh, the first type, the 10-1, 10-2, and 10-4 together, and we can obtain uh, the optimal neutralized antibody. But if we uh, mix the 10-1, 10-2, 10-3, and 10-4, there's only 10-3 uh, given a, a normal or neutralized antibody. But the 10-1 and 10-2 and 10-4 give a sub-neutralized antibody. It is a danger because uh, if it's not reach the four types with the neutralized antibody level, that can provoke a dengue disease. Until June 9, 2000. Then, that is the information that uh, I have obtained. What is your opinion, uh, Professor? Thank you very much. I think the question was, uh, is there a worry to developing a dengue vaccine which does not cover all four serotypes? Is that the question? I think it's a huge concern uh, and it is it is the reason why the dengue vaccine has been so difficult to make. Um, there's been a dengue vaccine program now for uh, almost 50 years. Uh, it started in uh, the 1950s um, and really started in real earnest 40 years ago in the 1960s and 70s in Thailand. The difficulty has been in making a vaccine that has dengue 1, dengue 2, dengue 3 and dengue 4 and covers each four serotypes equally so that when you vaccinate you get uh, immunization against all four serotypes. That's been incredibly difficult to uh, make. I think the vaccine that's leading the way in terms of development has overcome some of those problems and will move into phase three trials in 2012. Um, and we will know the result about three years later. So probably by 2015, we will know if it's protected against all four serotypes. Yeah. Secondly, so, uh, does it uh, cover your question already, or still, uh, Professor Johnny, maybe? Uh, They'll have uh, another uh, question. Uh, thank you very much for the other opportunity. <coughs> Continued about the uh, vaccination. What uh, in phase three trials? Uh, what kind of uh, population they're going to use? It is a sterile uh, population without IgG negative, without any uh, contact with uh, the virus. Of uh, there's a normal population that they want to use for the trials. Yeah, it's also a very, very good question. Um, so the phase three trials, I'm, I'm not directly linked with any of these phase three trials, so I, I, I can only tell you what I know from uh, uh, information through WHO. And so the phase three trials are going to go on in multiple countries, 12 countries uh, in Asia and South America. They will go on in populations that are uh, that have seen the dengue virus and in populations that have not seen the dengue virus before. But the idea is to vaccinate individuals from aged two up to with no upper limit and to know the serological status before the vaccination, but in fact vaccinate people who are immune and people who are not immune so that you cover the whole spectrum of age and previous prior exposure. Um, both to dengue but also to other flaviviruses including yellow fever and Japanese encephalitis. So the phase three trials which will be close to 30,000 people globally uh, will cover all, all ages and all background immune, immune status. Thank you again uh, Professor Farr for this uh, quite straight answer uh, and also Professor Johnny. Uh, the next uh, opportunity I want to uh, give to Pajajaran University that uh, we uh, missed uh, early uh, uh, during this uh, video conference. Uh, 
please uh, any questions from Unpat in Bandung? Uh, thank you, Prof. Nelwan. Uh, uh, my name is Rudy. I'm coming from uh, Bandung. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, my first one is uh, why uh, some patients in dengue uh, develop shock, but uh, the other are not any. Uh, can we say about uh, predictors or something about that? And uh, secondly, maybe it is uh, too early, but uh, do you have results from, say, a trial of the uh, steroid uh, grip to a uh, dengue? It is uh, a possible benefit or not? Thank you. Uh, the the first question is uh, clear uh, why some get shocked and other not. But the second question, uh, due to the volume of the voices, uh, to uh, oh, steroid, yeah, okay, yeah. So there are two questions uh, actually uh, about why people getting dengue uh, get shocked and. The second one is uh, how about the status of uh, steroid uh, use in dengue? So, so the first one, um, I think if you could answer that question, why some people get shock and some do not, I, I suspect you'd get a Nobel Prize. Um, so I do hope somebody in Bangdong does that and you'll be getting a call to Sweden soon afterwards. It, it, it's a huge, it's a really difficult question to answer and we would love to be able to answer it. We'd even love to be able to say when you see a patient at an outpatient clinic, whether you could predict who has, who's going to go on to severe disease and who does not. We can't even do that. Um, at one point we were very interested in looking in people's urine and seeing if we could measure NS1 levels in the urine early in infection as a marker of capillary permeability through the kidney and specific test for dengue. Uh, unfortunately, it, didn't, it did not work out. Um, but in Bangdong, you see a lot of dengue patients. And if you were to establish a nice study to look at early dengue and who progresses and who does not, and whether you could develop algorithms for doing that, that would be a fantastic study for Bangdong to do, I think. The second question, steroids. Uh, steroids is a good question. Um, there have been three or four studies of steroids in dengue. Uh, they go back a long way now. Uh, they were very, um, they were not done in the way that you would do them today. Uh, and I think the question of steroids does need addressing. Um, we have recently finished, uh, or will soon finish, a study of methylprednisolone in, in dengue, trying to prevent progression to severe dengue um, in 320 patients, but we don't have those results yet. Um, but as soon as we do, we will certainly let Bangdung know the results. Thank you, uh, Professor Farrer, for these straight answers. Uh, the last uh, opportunity is to all uh, video conference, maybe uh, from outside Jakarta, uh, Pravijaya University, please. Uh, some questions for Professor Farrer. From the Maravijaya University, uh, is there any uh, questions for this uh, conference to so Professor Farrell? I think we have uh, lost communication. Uh, So uh, maybe uh, later we will come back to the Pravijaya University, but uh, in the meantime uh, I want to 
give the audience in the room a chance to ask direct questions uh, if there are any. Please uh, state your name and affiliation, please. Thank you, Prof. Nelwan and Professor Farrar. My name is Erlina Burhan. I'm from Pulmonary Department of University of Indonesia, but based on in Persahabatan Hospital. Yeah. Uh, our concern from the Pulmonology Department right now is TB in general. Uh, even though our rank right now third, uh, from third to below to fifth after South Africa and Nigeria, but still uh, there are resistance, TB resistance on the way. Um, in one year only, our hospital received more than 300 um, resistant uh, TB patients. So this is only one hospital. I would like to say that this problem also will be uh, actually also happen in other hospital, but not yet uh, appear because the problem of there is no diagnostic. There are not so many laboratory, laboratory that capable to do the culture and uh, resistance tests. So uh, instead of uh, treating uh, the disease, which is very, very difficult since the drug is less potent and then also very high uh, toxicity. But the real challenge is how to cure the sensitive uh, patient 100%. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, you've raised an issue which is hugely important. Um, drug resistance in TB. Uh, the second, all second line drugs in every infectious disease, but particularly in TB, are, are all second line for a reason. And, and those, the reasons are, they're all horrible drugs, they're all toxic, they're all expensive, and none of them work very well. Otherwise, they'd be first line drugs. And uh, you've got two problems. One is to prevent drug resistance developing in the first place. And then you've got the problem of how to treat drug-resistant patients. If you take the first one, I think the, the great problem globally is many TB programs around the world are good at treating nice people with TB. The problem comes in how do you treat the people that are migrants, who don't stay in one place, who may be slightly outside society or not have as much access to health care, which happens in every country in the world, and take TB drugs for a while and then stop taking it and then take it again. And that's where TB drug resistance really develops. If you could get every TB patient to really follow directly observed therapy with good doses, uh, you would probably prevent a lot of multidrug resistant TB developing. But that's a huge, huge challenge. We can do it with people who turn up to hospital, and but trying to reach the populations who are slightly outside society is a real challenge. And we, we cannot just ignore that population. We cannot pretend they don't exist, because that is, it both for them as individuals and the population, that's the key issue, I think, is how to get everybody to take the drugs. But ultimately, I... I don't know if you've ever tried to take a seven-day course of an antibiotic. It's almost impossible to remember to take every dose. And you're asking people to take six months of TB therapy. What's desperately, desperately needed is a shorter regime. In my view, a shorter regime with higher doses to try and shorten the regime from f six months to four months to three months, and ideally down to a month. And maybe with the new drugs that are coming along uh, in the next few years, maybe that will be possible. What you haven't also raised is the issue of combined HIV TB, and and that is an enormous problem. Uh, they're often in populations who do take drugs 
occasionally and, and then stop. And certainly in Ho Chi Minh City, the rate of drug resistance among people who are co-infected with TB and HIV is very, very much higher. Uh, and also those patients often have hepatitis B and hepatitis C, and they have much more toxicity with the TB drugs. So I think for Indonesia, with a population of 300 million, 240 million people and increasing. Uh, TB has to be one of the great challenges uh, for Indonesia. Um, yes. Yeah. Because of lack of time, still one question uh, to be. What did that now? I can do. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Farah. I'm Rofina from Unpad, Bandung. Uh, it's a good opportunity for us to come here, even though it's traffic everywhere. So, but I'm glad I hear half half of your presentation or your lecture, and we are quite interested at the topic about the meningitis TB. Uh, yeah, in your lecture, it's stated it's a big challenge for us now, and so somehow someone has to find a better or more appropriate uh, uh, therapy for meningitis TB. Uh, I only want to share that we are among uh, uh, institutions who would like to also uh, respond to that challenge uh, by doing a, a clinical trial in order to find the a better regimen for meningitis TB by using either a higher dose of rifampicin and or uh, using um, quinolone. Uh, but like you say, it's it's really true. It's a big challenge. It's everywhere. Uh, bureaucracy uh, set up the clinical a good clinical trial. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but my question is actually how far we are now about the uh, treatment of meningitis TB. Thank you. And, and sorry, where do you come from where? Bandung. Bandung. Okay, yeah. so Bandung is very famous in TB meningitis Thank work. You. Uh, I think um, uh, Bandung has done a lot of very, very important work on pharmacology and uh, TB drugs. Uh, and I believe you're soon to start or going to start higher dose rifampicin and moxifloxacin. Um, so we are doing similar work except moxifloxacin is uh, very expensive um, and at least I'm not, I'm not convinced that it's better than other new generations fluoroquinolones uh, in terms of penetration into the CSF or anti-TB activity so we are not looking at moxifloxacin we're actually looking at levofloxacin um, and higher dose rifampicin. Um, the work from Bangdung shows that most patients in Indonesia are underdosed for rifampicin. Um, and are, instead of receiving 10 milligrams per kilogram, are often receiving closer to 5 or 6 milligrams per kilogram or 7. And that, I think, is just too low. In pulmonary TB, it may not matter so much. But, but only about 15 to 20 percent of rifampicin crosses the blood-brain barrier. And so if you take too little and then only 15 or 20 percent crosses the blood-brain barrier, you're taking far too little in the brain. And so I think the work that Bang Dung is doing on increasing the dose pharmacology and adding a fluoroquinolone is really, really important work. Yes. Yeah. Professor Farrell for this uh, uh, answer and uh, hopefully uh, Bandung and Ho Chi Minh City can start a uh, good relationship on this uh, topic of uh, meningitis TB. Uh, Rufina, I think, uh, has done a lot of work on the pharm pharmacology of uh, TB drugs, uh, even a PhD resulted from that. Well, I'm very sorry to say that uh, time has uh, run out for us, and maybe I have to uh, say uh, thank you very much for this uh, excellent uh, video conference uh, that was 
hosted by the Dean of the uh, Medical Faculty, University of Indonesia, Professor Pratibi, thank you. And I have to thank all the audiences. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> Maaf. Uh, Dr. Ratna Sitampur, uh, Ordin, thank you very much uh, for being with us uh, at this moment. And of course to all uh, our centers uh, throughout Indonesia, uh, thank you for your uh, uh, attendance and uh, hopefully uh, we can uh, do the same uh, in the future and uh, give you all the knowledge we have, uh, share with you uh, the latest uh, progress. And of course, uh, we have to be grateful, uh, most of all, to our guest speaker today, Professor Farrer. Thank you very much uh, for all the information you have uh, given us, and we hope to see you more often in the future. Well, give us, give him a big clap. Okay, um, thank you Prof. Nolan for conducting the session and also Prof. Jeremy Farrar for giving, giving us a lecture. So, uh, before, and also thank you for coming <laughs> Faculty of Medical Indonesia, Dr. Ratna Sitompul, and also Director of Cipto Manung Kusumo Hospital, Prof. Akmal Tahir. And also, before we go to the end of the guest lecture, from Medical University of Faculty, uh, Faculty of Medic Medical University of Indonesia would like to give souvenirs for the speaker and moderator. So therefore, we would like to invite Prof. Jeremy Farrar and also Prof. Nawawan to come forward first. And we want to ask uh, Dr. Ratna Sitompul to give the souvenirs. <laughs> 